Growing up, I was a glasses face nerd who unironically thought science fiction was the epitome of cool. So needless to say, I had tons of friends and no trouble talking to girls. <laughs> if by talking you mean staring at from an exceedingly safe distance. But for real, there was always something about science fiction that just perfectly clicked with me. I remember specifically this online video game called Halo. Halo was this wonderful place where I could fight aliens and make a friend and have someone tell me horrible things about my mother all in one spot. And it was wonderful. And as a kid, that's what science fiction was for me. It was magical and surreal, and I didn't mind looking past some of its faults. For Halo, those faults were being called curse words by a six-year-old. And as I've gotten older, I recognize that as a genre, science fiction can be a little rough around the edges. For example, if we go to Star Wars, we say it's a cinematic masterpiece, and it absolutely is. But at the same time, this man at the back of the Moss Eisley Cantina is wearing a bargain bin werewolf mask he bought for Halloween. And so science fiction has sometimes been cast aside by academia, called unfit for study, and only dumb, pulpy fiction that impressionable kids could buy for a nickel. Some scholars have even said that science fiction is only what will sell best being marketed as science fiction. And this is where I disagree. Science fiction can be stupid and have horrible prose, but beneath the surface, there's a lot of substance there. And as a kid, I recognized this. I read a life-changing novel about a young man named Ender who accidentally commits genocide against an entire alien race only because they're different. Which is pretty deep stuff for a seven-year-old. Thank you, Dad, for that age-appropriate recommendation and very scarring one. <laughs> and that passion stayed with me as I grew, very, very deep down, a guilty pleasure that I didn't dare tell anybody else about. And then last summer, I was granted the opportunity to study at Oxford, England, and take a one-on-one -on -one tutorial. And for my tutorial topic, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And as a sophomore, I now have even less. But I did know what I loved. So I wrote down science fiction. And the day came where we met with our advisor and talked about what we had picked. And these other kids had these mind-blowing ideas. Stuff like partial differential equations, which I guarantee none of us know what that is. And it got around to me, and I felt like such an idiot. And I looked down at my feet, and I was flushed and embarrassed, and I said, science fiction. And Dr. Snyder is much wiser than me, and he said, Brady, that's perfect. So I went to England, I studied these six books. I'd read the book, write an argument on it, and then go get proven wrong by my tutor. I remember my first paper, he read through it, he said, Brady, this is very impressive stuff, you did a great job. You really earned your 63%. <laughs> and while in England, I realized that science fiction does matter. It provides an unbiased view of the future, imposes ethical questions that need consideration as we continue to move forward and develop new technologies. And I look around the world today, and the things that these authors wrote about are very prevalent and very pressing, and it's terrifying, but it's also very hopeful, because we have these books as guides written years ago. So I started with Brave New World. And I recognize that science fiction can be descriptive of our current society and provide new and interesting viewpoints on it. Sci-fi uses what we call the literal metaphor. So in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, instead of abstractly commenting on the futility of robot life, Douglas Adams instead just creates a massively suicidal robot that everyone hates. Going back to Brave New World, for those who haven't read it, I'll give a very quick synopsis. Imagine a perfect world where everyone is completely satisfied and happy until one day some Violent Savage shows up, and he is rightfully cast out to preserve everyone else's collective happiness. Now, for those who have read it, you may notice I left out the use of a drug called Soma, which forces people to be happy, or the use of genetic engineering to create and preserve social classes. And that the Savage, as they call him, is the only one who has ever read Shakespeare, or cares about the arts like we do. But everything I said was true. So can we really call it a dystopian novel, like we often do, when everyone's happy? Or is it just a dystopia by our terms? And that's what I mean by a literal metaphor. The world state is an interpretation of collective happiness, while John the Savage is an individualist. And Huxley argues that the two are mutually exclusive. And so now it's up to us to decide. Is it worth it? Do we agree with John the Savage and we'd rather suffer as an individual, or would we rather be comfortably numb? And you can say, okay, this is just science fiction, it's never gonna actually happen. 
Let me read you a description of Soma. Soma is a sleep aid, relaxant, antidepressant, with no negative side effects. Or if anyone's heard of CRISPR, CRISPR is this method used to edit the human genome. It's been used to cure visual impairment, and they think it can do a lot more. And obviously, that's amazing. But when I said genetic engineering a couple minutes ago, it kind of the bad taste in your mouth. We read Brave New World because it's fun and entertaining science fiction. And Huxley also warns of what we're edging towards and highlights the choice we have to make between individual and collective happiness. With science fiction, he can do both, critique our society and where it's going in a popular and readable manner. Science fiction is also very predictive. These authors spent a lot of time thinking and writing about future technologies that didn't quite exist, but for all they knew might. Disclaimer, they were wrong, a lot. We did not send people to the moon by launching them out of a cannon like Jules Verne thought we would. But we did send people there. Look at George Orwell's 1984. One very interesting thing in that book is the monitoring that the party does of its citizens through their televisions and with cameras and such. And we joke about the FBI agent watching our phone, but the reality of it is we are being monitored. Google remembers the things you look up. Facebook tailors your newsfeed to your interests. At what point do we draw the line? I'm not saying your phone is always on and recording, but there has to be a privacy breach here. Look at this disclaimer for this website, if you can read it. That's very vague. We don't know what's being collected or how it's being used. When does the internet become a necessity, and how do we prevent these unwanted privacy breaches? Orwell wrote about this in 1949. The digital camera wouldn't even exist for 30 more years, but we can't say he was wrong, and he predicted a lot of the privacy scandals we see today. It gets better. Move on to Isaac Asimov. He was a really smart guy. He wrote a series of books called Foundation centered around this theoretical field called psychohistory, which deals with the reactions of human conglomerates to fixed social and economic stimuli. In other words, it's predictive, and it can tell what thousands of people are going to do with near-perfect accuracy. And that's absurd, right? We are far too emotional and unpredictable for that, or so we used to think. But if I tell you all to think of a random number right now, statistically speaking, you just thought of seven or three, and something subconsciously told you to think of that. I mentioned Google earlier. Now, it's an imperfect system. If I buy a vacuum cleaner off Amazon, Google thinks that this was just the first in an impending collection of vacuum cleaners. <laughs> but it's getting better, and it's all being done by a computer. Over at Inspark, they're using big data about our routines to create efficient cities. We're not as random as we like to think, and predictive mathematics is on the rise. But that's a dangerous game to play. Because what gives purpose in our life when everything is predetermined? Is efficiency worth destroying randomness? Right now, that's what we're going for. Something Asimov predicted 70 years ago, and more importantly, showed moral consequences with. And then we get to my personal favorite topic, which is robots. We love our Roombas, but I think that we can all agree that an intelligent machine won't get eternally trapped in the purgatory known as a corner. <laughs> Asimov wrote a lot about robots, and he laid out three pretty strict rules. Basically, a robot can't hurt me and has to do what I say. And that sounds pretty foolproof initially. But what if I tell a robot to go get me a gun, and then I use that to kill somebody? Or what if a robot sees my girlfriend cheat on me, and I command it to tell me what it saw? Is emotional trauma considered injuring me? In one of Asimov's most famous stories, a group of supercomputers take over the world not to kill us, but because that's the most efficient way to prevent us from killing each other. Oftentimes in science fiction, we think of robots as villains who overthrow and kill humanity. But Asimov shows us that even as tools like we use them today, there's a lot of room for danger. Now, Asimov's robots are pretty submissive to their slave status, but other authors press this issue. Like, what gives us the right to command an intelligent machine only because it's not organic? Furthermore, what even is intelligence or sentience? Philip K. Dick and Arthur C. Clarke asked these questions. Dick's androids, unlike Asimov's, are fully demanding of their freedom. And the only thing that separates them from us is their inability to feel empathy, which can cause them to be violent, but not necessarily. After reading the book, I eventually came to the conclusion that empathy is a very unique human trait. We love our cats, although they hate us, and we name our cars for some odd reason. But is that really our only justification for rights? Do we get to command something that we created just because we didn't give it empathy? Arthur C. Clarke personalizes a machine with HAL 9000. HAL is a technological marvel who is accidentally endowed with a conscience and goes mad after grasping an understanding of death. 
it's really sad. Hal has a creator. He can sing, he can think, but he's unplugged all the same only because his programming caused him to break. These books make it difficult to ignore the similarities between robots and slavery. And that's fine for now, but what do we do when robots reach that next level of sentience? I'd like to show you a conversation I had with a friend not too long ago. That seems relatively normal, except that's a robot called Cleverbot developed in 1997, and it's gotten a lot better since. You may have heard of the Turing test. We're getting close to beating it. So much so that a new test has been proposed called the Lovelace test where a robot must create an original work of art that can't be explained. Based on Clark and Dick, I'd like to add to that. A robot must also demonstrate empathy and have a genuine understanding of life and death to be fully sentient and intelligent. Stephen Hawking told a story shortly before his death about a group of scientists who created an intelligent machine. And they plugged it in, and they asked, is there a god? To which the robot replied, well, there is now. Robot rights is something I expect to encounter in our lifetimes, and in some ways we already have. I think in order to successfully mediate between us and these beings who are literally superior to us in every possible way, we need to have standards in place before they get here. And Asimov, Clark, and Dick are great starting points. And so with that, I finished my time in England and I came home. And in fitting college fashion, did absolutely nothing for the rest of the summer besides unsuccessfully working on my Tinder game. <laughs> and some of my friends would come up to me and say, Brady, how, how was England? What did you do? What did you study? And I'd proudly say, well, science fiction, of course. And they said, yeah, but so what? Well, this is what. My mom is a cardiac nurse practitioner, and she told me recently about an app that was developed to allow elderly patients to do online checkups to help them travel less. And that seemed like a great idea in theory, so it was implemented. But one thing they didn't consider is that elderly patients had trouble following directions without physical touch and communication. And as such, many of them took too many water pills and ended up back in the hospital with dehydration. We joke about the elderly not understanding technology, like my dear grandmother here. But in reality, this discretion can prove dire. Technology is evolving at an unforeseen pace. The future is right now. We spend so much time thinking if we can do something, we don't often stop and wonder if we should. And science fiction forces us to stop and consider that question. I'd like to close with two quotes I hold very dear. The first was framed on my father's office wall. Thomas Edison said, there are no rules here. We're trying to accomplish something. Sci-fi writers had no rules. They were cast out as only entertainment, and as such could wonder about fantastical things. With a flick of their pen, they created light speed travel, and intelligent beings, and alien species, and all these other things that no one else would take seriously. And now we realize how right they were. Also, my good friend Jack once told me, slightly egotistically, stupidity is only the failure to learn from your mistakes. We are making a lot of mistakes right now. We don't know who or what deserves rights. We don't know if it's ethical and acceptable to predict humans. We release data mining software that preys on internet users. Sci-fi writers already wrote about the mistakes we're going to make. So let's learn from them. There's no reason to be scared. We have the history of the future right here. Thank you.